in this story, Jesus says, well, he's died uh, because we're going to see God's glory. That's a recurring theme in John, like the man last week who was blind. Is he blind because he sinned or his parents sinned? He says nothing. He's blind because you're going to get to see God's work. It's happened before as well. Um, and then this, 11.6. I think I've asked you this before, but I came across it this week and I've got a whole office full of books and I couldn't get any of them to agree with me. Uh, do you see where I am on page 104? Now we can turn. We're going to be digging in here. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he's in fact dying, Jesus stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And there's paragraph and pages and chapters on why did Jesus not go right away? His dear friend Lazarus is dying. The sisters have come to ask, why does he stay two days? And in Gospels that typically don't preoccupy themselves a lot with a number of days, what's going on here? Why the delay? I've been counting on you all week. I knew Brett would go here. I have. I thought, should I ask or not? Because they're going to stare at me with blank faces like they sometimes do, and that scares me. Uh, no, Brett, because he loves the group third day, will know the answer. <laughs> Brett says that uh, if he stays two days, that means, oh yeah, the rest of the story takes place on the third day. And now we're not talking time either. Now we're talking resurrection. It's the one biggest resurrection story in the whole book. And it also happens just like the tomb stories with Jesus on the third day. I think it's a red flag. I, come on, we're about to get in the deepest stuff, but I, I, I can't find a commentator to pick that up. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. But in the, a little later on, it says you've been in the tomb for days. Now when he gets there, so by the time they, they... Apparently it takes them a couple days to get to him, maybe. It's only two miles. I know, maybe they're slow walkers. <laughs> you, should, you need to write about this. I know. Seriously, I, I read that almost a very common word for a word. Well, it takes some time for the message. No, Bethany is right next to Jerusalem. Come on. Uh, so there's some fishiness here. I love it, Lynn. Um, all right. Uh, in 9 and 10, as uh, Laura was reading, we recognize these themes in John. John thinks symbolically all the time, light and dark. When you walk in the light, you see God, but those who are in the dark don't understand this kind of stuff. It would be compelling in chapter 20 when it begins early on the day, uh, early while it was still dark. They go to the tomb. Important things for John. And the sleep and death humorous line, we've seen this also in John. Disciples are so clueless, they're obviously listening at a very literal level when Jesus is speaking at a deeper level. And there's this play back and forth. John wants us to enjoy that, be stuck with it. It's going to be critical in a moment when we talk about resurrection. Two, two ways of talking about it. Um, in 16, I just want to pick this up. Because I often tell you something like this. Uh, it is, this is the Mary, by the way, according to John, who anoints Jesus uh, with her expensive lotion and gets yelled at for it. And Jesus says, hang on, she alone understands what's going on here. And I've always said, uh, boy, she's the first disciple, really. She understands death. And we're only halfway through John. But now we're a whole chapter early, and Thomas says this, uh, who was called, the twin said to his fellow, let us go also, since he's so determined to go back to Judea where they didn't like him, where there's conflict brewing, where we almost got arrested. Let's go also that we might die with him. Uh, that's not bad. Thomas sees something. That no we're going to beat up on Thomas later on. Oh, doubting Thomas. He gets it here. He knows what's at stake. All right. Uh, and then, yes, in 17, four days best answer I can give you, Lynn, is that at this point, that four days is also uh, not so much chronological as theological and, uh, or something like this. We believed at the time that the Spirit lingered around the body for three days. And so what John really wants to say is this is a miracle of miracles. Uh, it wouldn't be such a miracle if it had only been dead for 20 minutes or three days, but I see your skepticism. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so gradually, successive uh, resurrection. All right. Uh, Eleven twenty-one. Now we're almost to the new section. Martha said to Jesus, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died." Now that's an extraordinary claim as well. 
So whatever else she believes, she thinks that Jesus has the power to keep him from dying. That's quite an acclamation as well. It's a great chapter. Uh, bravo, Martha. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. That is a little indirect, isn't it? But we assume at this point already, Martha thinks, um, you could raise him from the dead. It's not happened before. So now I'm back to Martha as really deep disciple. Oh my gosh, she understands who Jesus is, what he can do. This is serving this conversation we recognize in John also where people gradually grow in their faith. The woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, the blind man, they, they grow in appreciation for who he is and what he does. And here Martha has these language. Um, here we get to the heart. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Gorgeous sentence. It could mean at least two things here. And we're about to dive into it. Martha said to Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Duh, Jesus. Everyone gets raised together on the last day for judgment. Just like we talked about a few chapters ago. Lord, I know what resurrection is. I know we're all going to be raised Again, Jesus said to her, and I guess if, you had, if your friend came back and said, I can't even read a chapter, what verse am I going to read? Jesus saying to Martha, I mean, more so than Jesus raising Lazarus, I think. Jesus saying, I, I know you're thinking John 3.16, that's what the football players have on their cards or their, the fans in the stands. Uh, you and I, however, should change that. Take your placard, Jeff, when you go to the Broncos game and put John 11, it's a little longer, but do uh, 11, uh, 25. And people say, what, it's John 3, 16. Don't you know your Bible? And you say, no, hang on. The claim here is what Jesus says from himself. I am the resurrection and the life. Extraordinary. How can that sentence mean what it say? What a thick, impossible sentence at the heart of our theology, at the heart of this story, how can a person be that last event when everyone's raised? But that's where we are. Um, I know, help. All right. Yes, Lord, by the way, those who believe in me, even though they die, hmm, that's bad news, Jesus. Couldn't we just go? We'll live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, and I believe this is an inadequate answer, but I'm not sure it might be adequate. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah. We've already been there. The Son of God, we've already been there. The one coming into the world, good. Jesus is he's saying something a little bigger than that, which is why the story continues. Help, help, help. I need to go to Dale Bruner. Um, so Dale Bruner, not a liberal by any sense of the word the most evangelical conservative teacher I've had. His book on John is hefty. Um, Lynn, you loaned me this great book. This is all a note. Uh, American Gospel, thank you so much. Would you say that writer is conservative or liberal? I would say he's on the conservative end of the spectrum. Why do you say that? Well, this is... So he's got some experience. This is church and state issues. The history of our country, separation of church and state. But I just think because he, he uh, takes a more strictly interpretational view of how the Constitution was formed and how it was written. All right. More, I would say a strict interpretation of, rather than a liberal interpretation of the Constitution. All right. Uh, he's trying to get at what the writers meant initially. I appreciate that. That's helpful for me. I find in that book and in this book, when we get academic enough, when we finally do our homework, we in fact get a little beyond liberal conservative. And we can find from the very start in our Constitution as well, both strands, and we understand the choices we make in bringing the tradition forward. I bring that up because I read his book, great, inspiring, makes you want to be an American, makes you want to be better at church and state, better at giving both religion voices and making sure no religion, including Christianity, has preference over the others. There's the problem. I keep on finding, when I dig deep enough into the fonts, that our black and white liberal conservative thinking is, is woefully inadequate. Bruner taught me that. 
that when we go back to the text, in this case not the Constitution, but our Bible, what we find is, yes, roots of all that stuff and something more that we bring forward, and it has to do with uh, integrity uh, and depth of analysis and some hard work where we realize, okay, I want to be, we want to be people of the word. Um, here's what Bruner says regarding resurrection and that great line from 667. <laughs> Jesus makes, and you're, oh, don't worry, Jesus makes eschatology existential, the future present, hope visible, the then, the now, the thing, a person. I mean, he spent, that's only 600, he's, you know, 1,200 pages of a book. Um, Jesus makes eschatology, that's the study of the end. It's what happens on judgment day. He makes that existential daily living. That's what's going on in this specific extraordinary verse. Jesus somehow brings the end here, the future that evaluates everything into the present. Hope, how we live, what we long for, visible, the then, the now. That thing, awesome, judgment, scary, wonderful, evaluative, moral, a person in Jesus. Uh, it's an extraordinary verse. Uh, like I said, maybe the centerpiece of our faith. All right, now, sorry, now we're on to John 11. Let's finish up the story with what happens next. Um, 